That same Saturday night, the DHIs met at the Indian encampment across from Tom Sawyer Island. At 8 o'clock, the park was still open, so they waited for its closing by hiding invisibly inside the teepee. We'll make our move during the fireworks finale scheduled at 8.30. All eyes will be aimed at the sky. Why not just wait until closing? After what happened at It's a Small World, Disney announced that they're increasing security. That means patrols, probably in pairs, maybe in golf carts. We can't afford to get busted. So we cross the park while there's still guests inside. Seeing a DHI will make sense as long as it isn't past closing. How did those dolls come to life? How do we come to life? We were designed to cross over, if you believe Wayne. The dolls most definitely were not designed to march around attacking people. A certain woman with a green face comes to mind. A spell? Finn found it odd but cool to be invisible, to be nothing but a voice. He wondered if Maybeck had gotten as good a look at Jez's mom as he and Amanda had. We can talk about this later. For now, we'll travel in groups. Never all five of us together, in case we should get caught. And no matter what, we never go it alone. Two groups. Finn and me, the three of you. No one objected. Maybeck, did you get it? Yeah. Hang on, I left him by the door. Maybeck's arm appeared by the TP's open door. He produced five pairs of plastic glasses. I got here a little early. What's with that? Walt's comment to Wayne, and then something a friend of mine said about perspective. Don't get it. As I recalled, Walt's exact words to Wayne were, I have plans for this place that should put things into perspective. In the late 50s and 60s, 3D movies were all the rage. Walt was an illustrator and a movie maker. He would have known all about perspective. These days, the 3D movies are some of the coolest things in the park. I think Walt mentioned it to Wayne for a reason, and Wayne and the others never picked up on it. Perspective. 3D. You have to wear special glasses. That's why Maybick and the girls are returning to It's a Small World. What? We missed a clue. We should have found something. Those dolls did not want us in there, or maybe they wanted our attention on them and not the scenery. What if we weren't looking from the right perspective? You think the glasses are the answer? Philby and I are going to take the next, Clouds, while you guys are at It's a Small World checking out the Mayan sun, this time with glasses. Isn't going back there a little risky? It's the last place they'll look. Lightning doesn't strike twice and all that. A coil of wind swirled outside of the teepee, tossing up dust. It quieted the group. They waited a minute or more to feel a chill or see Maleficent, but there was nothing. What do you suppose happens to us back home in bed if we're getting busted on this side? I think my parents are suspicious. Mine are too. They think I'm sneaking out. My mom's all uptight. Going to bed at 8 doesn't help things. My aunt thinks I've totally lost it. Finn asked Philoby and Willa what, if anything, they learned about the clouds, the next clue in the fable. There are clouds in so many rides. Pooh, Peter Pan. But the ride with the most clouds, and biggest clouds, is Splash Mountain. That's where Finn and I will start. Start what? When we're inside the attractions, we'll all wear the glasses. We'll gain a better perspective. Let's meet back at the apartment at 10. The button is up there. Use it if you have to. Listen up. Majority rules. If you guys need to leave the park, then use the remote. What if it takes all of us at the same time? What if we're wrong about needing to be close to it? Then we'll find out the hard way. We should get going. What's the matter? You got a hot date? Not with you, I don't. The four others booed him. Maybeck went right on grinning, unperturbed. Finn and Philoby climbed into Splash Mountain's waterway carefully. The dark water was cold. Finn did not like the feeling at all. Are we sure that this was worth it? Do we have a choice? They slogged their way through the first part of the ride, around some turns, and soon encountered a rubber conveyor incline that proved a tough climb. It grew darker the deeper they went into the ride. 
Aside from his cold, wet legs, Finn felt a different chill all throughout his body. He considered mentioning it to Philippe, but he didn't want to sound afraid like Charlene. They climbed through a second tunnel, much longer and darker than the first. It had stairs on either side for maintenance and emergency evacuation. Only the orange night sky and a slight glow from their holograms offered any light. Once through this second tunnel, they rested briefly before passing a massive tree on their left. In one scene, there was a ladder hanging from a branch with a laundry line to their right. Here, the water current was strong and the going more treacherous. I think we ought to float. What? Float? Philippe lowered himself into the full water and leaned back. The water current quickly carried him away from Finn. Reluctantly, Finn did the same, not wanting to be left behind. Both boys maintained their balance and direction by keeping one hand on the steel rail meant to guide the ride's boats. I've taken this ride a zillion times, but this is pretty cool. Finn didn't love being soaking wet, but he too was enjoying himself. Then they entered a dark scene, a cave-like space filled with audio animatronic figures. The characters, turned off for the night, all stood frozen in mid-gesture. Kinda creepy. He'd had enough. The going was perfectly flat here, the current slow. He grabbed the rail and prepared to climb out. Philippe dove forward, splashing them both, and grabbed hold of Finn. You can't do that. If we climb out, we'll trip the alarm. What alarm? They use infrared sensors to detect anyone who tries to get out of a log car during the ride. But the ride shut down. But does the infrared shut down? I doubt it. Besides, there are 36 hidden cameras along the ride. If we climb out, we'll be photographed. It's pitch black. But we're not. We'll be photographed. Trust me. And if we're photographed, are identified and busted. How do you know any of this stuff? Can you spell Google? And you waited until now to tell me this? I wasn't gonna write you a report. Philippe snapped back irritably. Finn's fear grew more tense the deeper they ventured into this cave. They floated faster now. As the route twisted and turned, the waist-deep water in the ride chute was getting deeper, and the water was flowing faster. If I remember right, we're going into a small drop. Both boys rushed down the drop. Finn's head went underwater and he heard something grinding, something mechanical. He bobbed to the surface. Did you hear that? The ride's turned off. That means the log cars are moving. Finn recalled the marching dolls. He had no desire to try to outrace metal boats shaped to look like logs. Another drop. The water tried to swallow them, but the boys remained on their backs, arms extended to stay afloat. At the bottom, Finn looked ahead to see another tunnel approaching. I don't like this. As they neared the tunnel, they saw lights and heard music playing. Voices sang. You've got to keep moving along. The robot's voices were moving. Giant creatures with long noses and big, bugged out eyes rocked and danced. One threw a fishing line at the water. I'm starting to think getting busted wouldn't be too bad. Not yet, we've got to hang in there. The two boys swam and bounced their way along the water route. They passed fake green hills and low hanging tree branches, and a six foot tall rabbit holding a paintbrush. These things looked devilish to Finn, as he saw them looming above him. The ride takes a total of 11 minutes to complete. We're halfway along, and I bet we are, then the first log car shouldn't arrive for another 6 minutes. By that time we'll only have a couple of minutes to go. Why doesn't that sound terribly reassuring? Next were mountain backdrops and 12 foot high bears. Finn looked away cold and shivering and anticipated the arrival of a steel log. Clouds! Finn saw them in the backdrop, 
They were painted behind a mountain range. He wormed a hand into his pocket and donned the pair of 3D glasses, just as Philippe did. Nothing. The clouds looked perfectly normal. Finn squeezed the glasses back into his pocket with difficulty. This is crazy. What are we doing here? And why is the ride turned on? The more important question is, who knows we're in here? And why was the ride turned on? If you're trying to cheer me up, you're not doing a great job. A giant robot jumped across the scene and called out loudly, which caused Finn to splash in self-defense. Okay, Finn thought. Now I'm defending myself against mechanical rabbits. What if these robots came alive the same way the dolls did? Okay, I would like to get out of here. <laughs> More clouds! Finn fumbled with his glasses again, wearing them. He took in the clouds in the sky. Still nothing. Presently, there were chipmunk voices singing something at such a high pitch and volume that Finn couldn't understand a word. But he could feel the logs approaching. Philippe kept glancing over his shoulder. He could feel them too. A low male voice began narrating the ride. The scene became as dark as the inside of a stomach. The boys bounced off the rails and shoot walls. Bruised and cold, Finn grew increasingly desperate. Exactly what are we doing here? His head came up from underwater again. My bad, Finn. But keep the glasses on, okay? Keep an eye out for more clouds. A large wolf wearing a cowboy hat and holding a rabbit was saying something that was probably funny, though Finn wasn't listening. His ears tuned to the steady groan of the system, the approach of the log cars. Maybe we risk the cameras. And have our DHIs removed from the park? I don't think so. Finn knew this was right. He felt his courage gathering and was glad to have it back. They slipped down a dip, traveling even faster in the dark churning water. Finn saw a light up ahead. He felt a profound sense of gratitude. The end of the ride in sight at last. But then he remembered where they were. Next up was a really big drop. The ride's biggest drop of all. It's the biggest thrill. Thrill or kill, Finn wondered. He backpedaled, fighting the current. That baby's about four stories. Straight down, 45 degrees, a million gallons of water driving into you like a freight train. Their bodies slapped forward, closer to the edge, despite their vigorous splashing. It'll either crush us or we'll drown. Philippe didn't disagree. I said it'll either crush us or we'll drown. Yeah, I think you're right. He rolled onto his stomach and tried to swim away from the drop, but it was no use. The water was too fast. Finn also rolled over and started swimming. He tried for the edge, happy to climb out, even with the risk of getting busted. But the strong current prevented him from reaching the side. He panicked. Though the two boys swam fanatically, they were actually moving with the current towards the drop. If we could get onto a log... Was that possible? Finn wondered. It did seem like the perfect solution. How much longer until a log arrived? Finn wondered. He twisted his watch while flapping the other arm in an awkward crawl. Any moment, he decided. Sounds like a plan. Keep swimming. They were both still slipping backward despite their efforts. The ride's dramatic plummet drew near. It felt to Finn as if he was being sucked down a giant drain. We're not thinking right. The first log appeared. It looked big and powerful, and it was coming right for them. We're made of light, Philby. Holograms. We're half light. We aren't solid. Wayne talked about Einstein and how we're more space than atoms. He couldn't see Philippe through all the splashing. I don't think this is the best time to discuss physics. 
Besides, I probably know more about it than you do. They heard a loud whack and bump from the dark as the log grew closer. If we're mostly light, then water current can't affect us. Light moves through water. It doesn't get carried off by it. Driven by his newfound confidence, Finn rolled onto his back and stroked more gently. Slowly, he pulled away from Philippe and with half the effort. It's all what I'm thinking, he realized. Philippe watched as Finn's glowing body, brighter now, swam past him upstream. In doing so, Philippe allowed himself to relax for a moment. A moment too long. Philippe was sucked down the throat of the final plummet. Time slowed. Philippe tumbled through space and water, holding his breath and then sucking for air. His lungs burned. He couldn't tell what was up or down. Then admit a swirl of black. A hand appeared. A human hand. Glowing as if it had been plugged into a wall. Behind that hand another shape formed. The shape was an arm. Finn's arm. Finn was inside the log car, leaning over. The two boys locked hands, and Finn dragged Philippe up and into the log. The log threw out a tremendous splash as it reached the bottom of the chute. By the time Philippe had righted himself, now sitting up, the log had snaked through the chute and entered yet another scene. This was the last scene, the most exotic scene of the attraction. Finn and Philippe scrambled for their glasses. How did you do that? I'm not sure, but I think it was all in my head. Behind the paddle boat, Finn spotted large pink clouds and a big blue sky. His head swirled with the sounds of voices singing zip a dee doo da He slipped on eyeglasses. There, behind the snowboat, he saw a bunch of clouds. In the middle of one of the biggest clouds, he saw several big letters. They appeared to have spray painted F-M-E. When Finn lifted his glasses, the letters disappeared. Our first clue! Finn whispered, looking for the exit.